Hello there. This lecture is all about how to interpret descriptive statistics. And you'll find descriptive statistics in journal articles or description of research for all different types of research strategies, not just correlational or differential research. So this lecture will really help you understand journal articles and research results for a variety of types of different research strategies. So in addition to going over the basics of what central tendency measures and variability measures can tell you, I'm going to apply those concepts to an example journal article that I published with some of my colleagues and just show you how that would look in real research so that you feel more prepared to look at journal articles for our future assignments. So here are some general guidelines about the best way to approach making sense of an academic journal article. It's best to start by reading the abstract, especially if you're doing a literature review and you're trying to find articles that are relevant to your study. Reading the abstract can really help you know whether or not your study is relevant. And I'll tell you from experience, sometimes those titles can be misleading and you're doing a lit search and you find an article that looks perfect and then you read the abstract and you're like, crap, this isn't what I'm looking for. So the abstract is there really to help author or to help researchers make sense of the overall study and make sure that it's relevant to what they're looking at as well. Then you can just kind of quickly read the entire article without really stressing the details. Maybe highlight things that you maybe have questions about or things that seem really important, but just kind of get a general feel for the article and what they did. Then you can go back, and if you're trying to write a summary of research, you can go back and try to summarize it in your own words without really looking at it. You don't want to do a copy-paste thing. You may want to read some of it and then write down what's important from that in your own words. Remember, the introduction section of a manuscript gives you the basic background information and is really there to justify the hypotheses you want to test based on them being supported by past theory and past research. And then you also kind of dig into, here are some of the gaps in past research, and here's how my study aims to fill those gaps and expand our knowledge of this topic. And then usually the introduction ends with the hypotheses that you kind of built up to by describing what past research suggests. The method section of a journal article is like the recipe for the study. It tells you exactly how variables were measured, variables were manipulated if you're doing an experiment or quasi-experiment. It tells you what the participants in the study experienced and how they actually conducted the research. And the method's really important so that people who are reading it can kind of evaluate how valid and reliable their methodology was. And so that if they want to borrow some of their methods to replicate some of their findings, people can do that as well. Then the results really go into the nitty gritty of the statistical analysis and the findings there. And usually in a results section, you will see tables and figures with numbers and, and visualizations, but there'll also be a written description of what happened in the results and what the results suggest, and also whether or not the actual results supported or did not support their hypothesis. Then the discussion is really focused on looking at the overall big picture, it kind of summarizes the results again, focusing on what's most important. It goes into the implications of those results. So what should people who are, you know, doing things in the real world, doing things in the field, how should they use these research findings to do a better job? Or how can these findings be used to have a better understanding of human nature? And then also the discussion provides you with some of the limitations of the study and future directions of kind of where we should go from here. So when a researcher is developing a study, the discussion is really useful because if they get a recent article, they can look at the discussion and see what they suggested be done next and maybe dig into that for their own research. So what we're going to focus on, though, is the statsy part of it, the results section, and looking at the key findings for hypotheses of interest. And I'll show you what those look like in tables and what they look like in writing. So I'm going to be showing you an article that I published way back in 2014 with my colleagues Lee Sing Zhong and Tahara Probst. And we looked at the frog pond effect, which is basically like if you're a big fish in a little pond, right, you're going to feel better. And if you're a small fish in a big pond, you're going to feel worse. And really th focusing on relative deprivation. So comparing what you're going through to what everybody else is going through and then looking at those outcomes for employees in a time where there was budget cuts at the university where we were studying employees. So here is the abstract for that article. And remember, the abstract gives a very you know, basic summary and overview 
of the entire article. So just take a moment, pause this video, and go ahead and read that abstract so that what comes up next will make more sense to you. So just pause and read the abstract and then come back to me. So now that you've read the abstract, see if you can answer what type of study strategy this was. Maybe pause and think about it for a minute. Okay, so this was correlational research because we examined the relationship among variables that were naturally occurring and we didn't go in and manipulate anything. This research was done around the time of the, um, the recession and so we were looking at budget cuts that were happening anyway. We didn't go in and cut budgets, but we looked at naturally occurring variables. So now I'm gonna show you the descriptive statistics that we presented in this article and give you an overview of them and kind of an overview of how to interpret them. And then we will look in the next lecture at the correlation findings and then the next lecture, the regression findings as well. But for now, let's just focus on having an understanding of descriptive statistics and then looking at them in a real journal article. So I'm gonna go over some basic descriptive statistics starting with the mode. So the mode is the most common or the most frequent value, and it represents the highest point of the curve in a frequency distribution of data. So if you're looking at this picture here, your mode is going to be right here. And if you had a distribution that kind of looked like this, this would be your mode, right? It's always the high point. Because remember, distributions of data, this represents your variable, we'll just call it x, from lowest to highest, and then the y-axis represents the frequency from zero to lots, <laughs> to the highest frequency. Lots of people had that. I'm using a mouse to do this, so forgive me for the chicken scratch there. All right, so then the median is the midpoint for your data. And it just tells you what value separates the top 50% from the bottom 50% of responses. And in a normal distribution like this, your median is gonna be really close to your mode. So modes and medians are critical for descriptive research, but they don't really have much use in hypothesis testing where we're examining the statistical significance of difference or relationships. But you still may see modes and medians in journal articles, but probably not so likely. What you will see is the mean. And the mean is the average, and it has a different notation depending on your field. So for instance, in psychology, it's an M for the sample mean. In business, it's X bar for the sample mean. And it, the notation also depends on whether you're working with a sample or a population. So when you're working with the population, you'll see Greek letters notating the mean or even the standard deviation, which you'll see in a little bit. When you're testing a hypothesis about differences in a dependent variable or outcome, between conditions of an independent variable or manipulated intervention or levels of a quasi-independent variable or a non-manipulated predictor, researchers compare means. You will also see means reported in correlation tables, and those are there to help the reader understand the overall trends and results for each variable. So, you know, are they, and they're looking at those variables separately, so they wanna know, you know, is there overall high or low scores on average for each variable? The standard deviation is the most commonly used measure of variability, and it is a critical value to consider in hypothesis testing. If the standard deviation is large, then the data is more spread out. So you would have like a fatter curve. And that means that, and really a large standard deviation is any standard deviation that's greater than the mean, so keep that in mind. So if you have a large standard deviation, the data is more spread out, fatter curve, and that means there's more variability in those scores that you're looking at. And this is kind of consequential because if you have a situation where there's more variability in outcomes or inconsistent responses to survey questions across study participants, then there's probably gonna be more error in your measurements of the dependent variable. And so if there's a greater margin of error, remember error is really any difference that doesn't have anything to do with the independent variable. So if you have more variability, there's more spread out scores, there's more inconsistency in your scores, you have a greater margin of error, which makes it more difficult to be confident that the observed differences in the dependent variable between conditions and levels of the independent variable are due to the independent variable and not just random differences that exist among people 
in the study regardless of their level of assigned conditions or their level of the independent variable. So again, if there's a larger standard deviation, it makes it harder to get significant findings because there's just a larger margin of error, where if you see differences between groups, you don't know if that's because the data is really spread out or because your independent variable worked. And then if you had less variability, smaller standard deviation, you have more consistent scores, less spread out. Most people tend to cluster around a certain value in your data set, and it's easier to detect differences because if the scores weren't very different before, but now they are, it's probably because of your independent variable. The standard range is really useful, and it tells you the range of most values or scores or data points for one variable. And you can compute it by subtracting the standard deviation from the mean to get the low end, and then adding the standard deviation to the mean to get the high end. So the standard range is especially useful in normal distributions like you see here, because it results in a predictable probability. So in a normal distribution, roughly 68%, as you see here, of scores fall within one standard deviation of the mean, either above or below. And remember, a normal distribution is where most people have values or scores that kind of land in the middle of the data, right, in the middle of the values, and then there's just a few people on the extreme ends having high or low scores. So I know that the mean and standard deviation can be kind of tricky. So I want to show you some examples of what happens to a distribution based on the mean and standard deviation and how you can evaluate specific scores from a data set based on a mean and standard deviation. We're going to be using the standard range and keeping in mind that these are normal distributions, but the standard range is still really useful even if you don't have a normal distribution. It's just that you won't be able to conclude that 68% of people were within the standard range. You could just say most people were in the standard range, again, if you don't have a normal distribution. So let's say, for example, you took two quizzes in two different classes. The standard range would let you know if your performance was similar to other students or not. So if your experimental psych quiz and statistic quizzes both had a mean of 80% and you scored an 85 on both, you really wouldn't know how much better you did than most of the class unless you had the standard range. So let me go ahead and draw these distributions, highlighting that standard range in the middle. And you'll notice that the width of my standard or my normal distribution will depend on my standard deviation. So just a rough sketch here. I busted out my bamboo pin so it'll look better than my chicken scratch before. So here's my y-axis, my x-axis. With normal distributions, your mean's always in the middle as well, just like your median and your mode. They all kind of land in the same spot. So here's what is happening. 80. Okay, that's in the middle. And then I kind of want my point of inflection to be on either end of my normal or my standard range. And so since my standard deviation is 2, 80 plus 2 gives me 82. 80 minus 2 gives me 78. So I know that most of my scores, my standard range, is from 78 to 82. And when I draw this out, right, most scores are there between 78 and 82. And so my value of an 85, let's use purple for that, would be pretty extreme, right? You're well outside that standard range. You're feeling pretty good about your performance on that quiz. Now let's look at the stats quiz. So there's our wonky y-axis, our x-axis. Remember, y represents how many people had those scores, right? The taller, the, the more people. And then our x-axis represents our actual values. Yet again, our mean is 80. But now our standard deviation is 10. So now most people scored between 70. It's really giving me a hard time here. And 90, right? Because 10 plus 80 is 90. And then 80 minus 10 is 70. So now when I draw this out, it's going to be a big old fat chungus graph. And now that 85 that you got isn't as impressive, right? Because lots of people got that score, right? So that 85 is in a high frequency part of your distribution. 
So the reason that I talk about this, even though we're really going to be focusing on hypothesis testing moving forward, is that if you were doing a study to test the effectiveness of something like a growth mindset intervention on quiz grades, it would be a much easier to detect the effects in the experimental class where quiz grades tend to be consistent before any intervention. There's so much variability in the stats quiz grades that it would be difficult to sort out the impact of a growth mindset intervention from all the random differences in stats quiz grades that occur naturally. So when you're looking at means and standard deviations, kind of keep that in mind. Remember, even when the study is focused on correlations, the means and standard deviations are typically reported for all variables. So you'll see that here in this um, correlation table from the journal article where you read the abstract earlier. So it's really important to consider the response scale when the variables of interest are measured on a Likert scale so you can know if the mean is relatively high or low. So in this journal article, as you see written in the measure section of the results, Everything was measured on a seven point scale, but job satisfaction was measured on a three point scale. So on average, even though this number looks small compared to the other means, that mean for job satisfaction is relatively high because it's only on a three point scale. But for the other variables that are on a seven point scale, you see kind of numbers around four ish. So there appears to be a moderate level of personal impact of budget cuts, affective or like emotional affective commitment or emotional attachment to the organization, a psychological contract breach or broken promises, turnover intentions or wanting to quit, and the departmental impact of budget cuts. So those are all kind of at moderate levels. Based on the standard deviations, there was a pretty consistent responses from department chairs about the departmental impact of budget cuts because the standard deviation was relatively small on a seven point scale and definitely smaller than the mean. But there was some disagreement or inconsistent responses about the level of psychological contract breach or broken promises that people experienced. And you know that because it has the largest standard deviation of all the variables that were measured. So now let's think about the standard range here. So for job satisfaction, the mean is 2.09, the standard deviation is 0.43. So you take 2.09 minus that standard deviation of 0.43 to get the low end of 1.66 and then take that mean of 2.09 plus the standard deviation of 0.43 to get the high end of your standard range of 2.52. So on a three point scale, we have pretty fairly high levels of job satisfaction where most people were between a 1.66 and a 2.52 ish on a three point scale. Now let's look at the standard range for affective commitment, which was measured on a seven point scale. Yet again, you take your mean of 4.08 you subtract the standard deviation of 1.39 to get the low end, and you add the standard deviation of 1.39 to that mean of 4.08 to get the high end. And you find that on a seven point scale, most people were between a 2.69 and a 5.47, or if you round it, since it was whole response options, between a three and a five. So they had moderate levels of affective commitment, but it was also pretty inconsistent. There's a pretty wide spread in that standard range. So here is the APA style reference for that journal article if you want to read the whole thing. And I hope that you got a lot out of learning about the mode, the median, and most importantly, the mean, the standard deviation, and the standard range. Just remember, when you're trying to make sense of results and you find differences, look at the mean to figure out which group had a larger level of that variable, right? Or which group had more of whatever you were measuring. And then if you're worried about how consistent responses were, you can look at the standard deviation. And then if you want to know the range of most scores, you just use that standard range.